let's welcome Dr. Uh, Anas to the last uh, session. Thank you, Dr. Hala and Dr. Akhtar for uh, moderating this session. Thank you all for coming on this uh, Friday morning. I know a lot of people prefer to be at home now, but uh, guys who are uh, advocate for their education would come. So thank you all for coming. And sorry for my voice. I think I have lost it to a viral infection. So today we're going to talk about three cases in acquired heart disease, and we're going to make it a little bit of a, an interactive session. Those are the presentation objectives. So this patient was in Abu Dhabi, actually I've been in Abu Dhabi for six months now, and I have met a lot of people and I'm looking forward to meeting even more people of you guys. So this patient was referred to me from one of the pediatricians in Abu Dhabi. Uh, Brennan was uh, an English patient. He's five months old and had four day history of high grade fever. He's fussy and difficult to, control, to console and he has no upper respiratory tract infection symptoms. So you examine him, the baby is really fussy, febrile, no rashes seen, no red eyes, no meningeal signs, no cervical lymphadenopathy, normal mucous membranes, hands and feet are normal, he's tachycardic and there's a flow murmur. So you know, this is a four day fever, patient is young and fussy, so you start doing the workup. CBC showed really high white cell count, 24,000, with 85% shift. He's a bit of anemic. CRP and ESR are very, very elevated in the hundreds. Albumin 2.9 and sodium 1 129. Platelets are high and liver function tests are also elevated, but not significantly. Urine analysis is normal and chemistry shows hyponatremia, which is a bit zero as well. So, the baby was admitted to the hospital here in Abu Dhabi, was started on ceftriaxone. Uh, also, there was no source identified yet, but blood cultures were taken and they started the patient on ceftriaxone. After four days of fever, uh, still on ceftriaxone, ID were consulted. They recommended lumbar puncture, which was done and was normal. CRP and ESR are still very elevated. There is no resolution of fever. 24-hour post-broadening of antibiotics to vancomycin and piperacillin tazobactam. So the patient received four days of ceftriaxone and then uh, one day of uh, vancomycin, piperacillin tazobactam. Also, he had four days before admission, so a total of eight to nine days of fever now. My question, anyone would treat this patient as Kawasaki disease? Who would treat this patient? Please raise your arms. Who would not treat this patient as Kawasaki disease? Why you would not treat him? If you can speak up. <laughs> Correct. So this patient does not fulfill the criteria for complete Kawasaki disease. But do we need to fulfill the criteria for each patient in order to treat Kawasaki? We do not, right? So there, are, there is an entity called incomplete Kawasaki disease. And even more recently, they added even patients who do not have any criteria of Kawasaki disease if they are really young, less than six months, okay, with history of fever for more than seven days. And this is where we really gonna be the point of this presentation. So you guys all know the diagnostic criteria for Kawasaki disease, fever more than five days, uh, and four out of the four, uh, five following. Out of those five, which one do you think is the least common? Out of the five? This, yeah, the least common one is uh, cervical lymphadenopathy. It happens in less than 50% of patients, but the other ones are really common. And I have to say, to be honest, most of the times now I see incomplete Kawasaki, patients with two to three signs rather than four out of five. So we have the rash, cervical lymphadenitis, changes in the lips and mucous membranes, extremity skin changes, and then purulent bulbar conjunctivitis. So this is the bulbar conjunctivitis in patient with Kawasaki disease. This is important. It involves the conjunctiva of the eyes, of the eyeball, not the conjunctiva of the eyelids. So to differentiate it from infectious conjunctivitis or allergic conjunctivitis, it only involves the eyeball, 
there is no pus, no theory. The other day I had a patient with suspected Kawasaki, but once I saw the conjunctivitis, actually swollen eyelids and very teary. You know this is not Kawasaki disease. Peeling happens a bit late, but you have also swelling of the arms and uh, feet, so extremity changes. The strawberry tongue with the swelling of the lips and fissuring. You have the rash, which is not very clear here, and the cervical lymphadenopathy. But, you know, the criteria for Kawasaki disease was introduced long time ago, and they found that we really miss some patients with Kawasaki disease who do not fulfill the whole criteria. And, and a lot of those patients developed coronary artery aneurysms. So the concept of incomplete Kawasaki disease was introduced to try to catch all these patients. This might result in over-treatment of patients who do not have Kawasaki disease, but at least, hopefully, you will not miss patients who have Kawasaki disease. So the concept was introduced in the revised criteria in 2006, and it's still used. So <coughs> we use this pathway. And this is from up to date, so it's, uh, you can get it. So any child with fever for more than days, five days, you have to have that. You cannot uh, say, a, you know, suspect Kawasaki from the first day or two, but now some people can suspect Kawasaki at day four of fever, okay, if they have a lot of the criteria. So more than five days. So now you look how many clinical diagnostic criteria of the ones we mentioned. If there is more than four out of five, this is Kawasaki disease consistent. You do an echo when you start treatment. If you, an echo is not available to you immediately, you start treatment, okay? And you get an echo later. If you have two to three criteria, so you have rash, for example, and you have conjunctivitis, but you don't have anything else, now you go through this pathway. The, now we call it suspected incomplete Kawasaki disease. You look the first, you look at the CRP and the ESR. If they are low, this is most likely not Kawasaki disease, okay? And you follow this patient clinically. If this patient later develops disquamation despite having a low CRP and ESR, then you have to go back and think maybe this is Kawasaki, even if the patient is not febrile now, but do an echo. Or could you see if he has unfortunately developed some aneurysm? But, so this is if in the case of low CRP to ESR. If the CRP and the ESR are high, then you say, okay, I have to find more evidence, okay? This is, can be really Kawasaki disease, and you obtain some blood work. The blood work, anemia, okay, for age, hyponatremia, liver function tests, urine analysis, uh, and the thrombocytosis, okay? If those, uh, you have two or three out of those five, then you say this is incomplete Kawasaki disease, okay? And you obtain an echo and you start treatment, okay? So more than three supplementary laboratory criteria, the ones we mentioned, anemia, thrombocytosis, hyponatremia, elevated liver function test, and urine analysis is abnormal. So now we come to this patient, our patient, this patient, our patient was less than six months old, right? And he had fever for nine days. So you have with zero clinical criteria other than the fever. So in order not to miss patients with Kawasaki disease who only present with fever under the age of six months, you do treat those patients. You obtain an echo and you treat, okay? Also, this might lead to over-treatment, but the problem with Kawasaki disease in younger age is the highest incidence of coronary artery disease. So patients who are younger than six months are at much higher risk of developing coronary artery disease. So those patients, you say this is possible Kawasaki, I'm gonna obtain a baseline echo and I might give them IVIG, okay? So a bit of talk about Kawasaki disease, also called the mucocutaneous lymph node syndrome. We always described it as self-limited because in most patients it is self-limited, but uh, the, if you don't treat, 20 to 25 percent of patients might develop uh, coronary artery aneurysms. If you treat, the incidence goes down to less than 4 percent. Cases below three months and eight years are usually rare, but can be severe. During the acute phase of the illness, microvasculitis happens, especially the coronary arteries, the axillary arteries, and the femoral arteries can also be involved. It uh, can also lead to diffuse pancarditis, so the whole layers of the myocardium can be involved. The patient can have dysfunction, can have mitral regurg, can have heart block, can have PVCs and VTAC. 
in severe cases. And later on, they develop high platelet count, which might increase the risk of myocardial infarction. Other manifestations of Kawasaki disease is sterile pyuria, <coughs> elevation in liver enzymes, arthritis or arthralgia, and gallbladder hydrops. So you know Kawasaki goes through phases. The phase one, we call it the acute, when most of the symptoms happen. Also, the, most of the blood changes happen here. The, and then the coronaries can get affected during this stage, but actually they get mostly affected in the second stage. So even if you do a normal echo in the first week, you can do another echo and you know that after two weeks to catch if the patient developed coronary artery aneurysms later. So in the subacute phase, most of the cardio manifestations happen here. So you have to get a repeat echo and there's worsening of thrombocytosis. And I'm sure you guys seen platelets above one million in patients with Kawasaki disease. And then in the last phase, this is when all the inflammatory markers go down, and if the patient does not have coronary aneurysms, I usually stop the aspirin after this phase. So as we talked about the complications, cardiac manifestations really are the worst, coronary aneurysms, thrombosis, stenosis, cardiac dysfunction, AV valve damage, dilation of the ascending aorta, effusion, and heart to block. So those, this is a very large LAD aneurysm. The problem with those aneurysms is that they can have really large thrombi inside that can migrate distally, or they can have stenosis distally and proximally to the aneurysm. And those can lead to myocardial infarction. And just this week, uh, I, had a, I did a cardiac catheterization for one of Dr. Suleiman's patients who have multiple aneurysms, uh, and he's on two antiplatelets. So he had something a bit similar to this. He had a large RCA aneurysm, and he has also another very, very small one here. His LAD was diffusely enlarged, and his circumflex was also enlarged. So the management of those patients, you always admit Kawasaki disease suspect patients. You start them on high-dose aspirin. We usually used to start 100, but recent uh, studies and practice, people have been going down to 50 per kilo, okay, with the same result. Antipyretics, in the presence of aspirin, probably better to just give him acetaminophen, avoid ibuprofen. IVIG, the highest dose give, given, two gram per kilo. And then consider oral or IV steroids, okay? And we will talk when to consider all steroids from the beginning. If you give the patient two doses of IVIG and there is no improvement, the still patient still febrile or inflammatory markers are still high, then you give pulse steroids, methylprednisolone, okay? And if the patient does not respond to that, then you uh, give infliximab. I, one time, I only I had to give infliximab. I know of another patient who had infliximab. I usually, you know, if, if you have an, a rheumatologist, you can involve in those cases. If you do not, unfortunately, you have to give it yourself. When the patient is much better, fever is gone, you want to discharge home, switch him from high-dose aspirin to low-dose aspirin, you know, anti, only antiplatelet dose, which is five per kilo. And then you give it for six to eight weeks till uh, or till platelets are normal, whatever is longer. If there is coronary abnormalities persist, so the patient will always be on aspirin. And in case of aneurysms, clobidogrel or even warfarin can be added. Clobidogrel is another antiplatelet, as you guys know. So would you start our patient on steroids along with IVIG and aspirin when the patient presented? Anyone here considers giving steroids to Kawasaki patients? So Dr. Hamdan does, Dr. does. Anyone else? Yeah. If none responds, huh? you give. But there is something called, the Kubaya this is only one score of many, the Kobayashi score, okay? The Kobayashi score tries to identify patients who might not be responders to IVIG. If you give the patient IVIG one dose, he's still febrile, you give him another dose, he's still febrile, you have lost two to three days right, of continuous fever. Those, the patients can be, get really sick of those, can develop coronary aneurysms. So you try to predict the patients who will not respond to IVIG. So patients with sodium less than 133, our patients was 129, 131. Patients with elevated AST, CRP is very high, neutrophils more than 80%, platelets less than 300,000. Also, you know, Kawasaki leads to thrombocytosis, but if it leads to thrombocytopenia, those patients are at a higher risk of non-responding. 
days of initial illness, less than five days, this is two points. And why this is important, the patient has developed really all the criteria of Kawasaki disease before day five of illness, which is not common. But this is tells you that this Kawasaki disease is really bad, okay? So you already diagnose Kawasaki disease before day five of illness, and age less than 12 months. If you have five or more points, then you, st you can actually add oral uh, prednisone to the regimen of the patient, even uh, with the, immediately with the IVIG and the aspirin, okay? And this is, not a new, this is not an old concept, this is a new concept. Okay, I've only known of the Kobayashi score like for two to three years only. So take home messages from case one. You do not have to fulfill four criteria to diagnose Kawasaki. There is incomplete Kawasaki. Infants less than six months with fever for more than seven days like our patient and with no other criteria, consider strongly treating as Kawasaki disease. In patients with risk of IVIG treatment failure, start steroids at the same time using the Kobayashi score. So that was the first case. I'm gonna go to case two and have questions later. This patient is from Jordan when I was working there. This is a 12-year-old, previously healthy uh, teenage girl, no issues at all. She presented to a local hospital with fatigue, shortness of breath, and pallor. She's very tachycardic. There was a pansocytic murmur, and she had lung crackles, and the liver is enlarged. She looked really sick and pale, so, and the uh, doctors at the local hospital suspected that she has cardiomyopathy or heart failure, so she was uh, transferred to our hospital, immediately admitted to the PICU. CPC was nonspecific, electrolyte shows hyponatremia, liver enzymes were mildly elevated, CRP and ESR were mildly elevated. Chest X-ray showed cardiomegaly, as you can see, and ECG showed this is, what do you see here on this ECG? You see ST segment changes, yeah. right? You see T wave inversion and left leads. This is never normal. Whenever you see T wave inversion and left leads, always suspect myocarditis or cardiomyopathy, okay? What else do you see? Is this sinus? This is not sinus, right? There is complete heart to block. The P waves are not related to the QRS. Right? Although sometimes they appear they are, but if you look at the P to Q interval, it's changing. Okay? So those patients, this patient has complete heart to block. So this patient had, as you guys all know, well, I suspected myocarditis. Myocarditis is a huge spectrum. It, those patients sometimes can just present with chest pain, and you do, uh, you see some of the inflammatory markers high, CPK is high troponin is high, or they can present really, really sick with complete heart failure. In pediatrics, viruses are the most often the culprit, especially parvovirus, HHV6, enterovirus like Kuzaki and EBV, and it really depends on your country and which viruses are more common in your country. For example, in Germany, they found parvovirus and herpes human, herpes virus 6 most common, but in France, which is not very far away from Germany, found that uh, Kogzaki B virus still was more common. So it really depends on where you live. In adults, there are many other causes. Radiation, sarcoidosis, giant cell, uh, myocarditis, eosinophilic myocarditis, which in pediatrics we really usually don't see. So the presentation usually chest pain, shortness of breath, easy fatigability, palpitations, and syncope. Patients will usually have a pansystolic murmur of mitral regurg, S3 gallop, increased GVP, hepatomegaly, and liver edema. So we talked about the ECG, chest X-ray, echo. Now MRI became an integral part of the diagnosis of myocarditis, especially milder forms of myocarditis. It can show you edema, scarring, and dysfunction. Biopsy was the gold standard long time ago, and then it fell out of fashion. People stopped doing them, but now again, actually it came, it's coming back, especially in adults because now differentiating many types of myocarditis, the treatment has widened and there are specific therapies for specific diseases. So myocardial biopsy is coming back. This is an MRI of a patient with myocarditis. You can see the wall edema, there is a scarring here, and then here in the interventricular septum. And if you do biopsy, it depends on the type, but usually you see inflammatory cells 
you can also do PCR and find a virus, a culprit. We had one patient once that we biopsied and we found actually RSV in the myocardium. Unfortunately, there is no specific therapy for most cases of myocarditis and the treatment is supportive. So mainly circulation support, whether with inotropes, sometimes it helps the heart to ventilate the patient, actually take the work of breathing of the patient and administer mechanical ventilation. And if everything fails, you have, if you have bad or ECMO in your center, it will help the patient a lot. So IVIG, most of the studies found that it does not work. Some studies, there was a study in pediatrics in India that showed it does work. So in really severe cases, probably it's, it's not a bad idea to give it, but give it very slowly. You know, IVIG is a lot of volume, right? So don't give it quickly. It's probably you have to give it over 24 hours. Anticoagulation with aspirin or warfarin, depending on the degree of dysfunction. If all fails, heart transplantation is the treatment. A cousin of mine who was actually living in the U.S. died of myocarditis uh, while acutely being on ECMO. He, they tried to transplant him quickly, but he died before transplantation. Uh, so complications, severe heart failure, ventricular tachycardia, fibrillation, thromboembolism, chronic dilated cardiomyopathy. Some patients recover from the acute phase and end up with kind of chronic severe uh, dysfunction. And, but if the function is not bad from the beginning, mainly 40, 45%, those patients usually make for recovery. And unfortunately, death. My patient actually, has unfortunately, continued to get worse. We, we actually have to find all the men renowned in the country, we got it from all the hospitals to keep her men renowned diuretics. She was intubated. Despite lack of evidence, we gave her IVIG, but we did not give her steroids. Patient was started on lidocaine for into intermittent VT. Then, fortunately, she passed after an episode of ventricular fibrillation. And we did not we did not have ECMO in our center. But if you have ECMO, it, she would be have a candidate. Now we're going to go to case three. Despite this patient name is Ahmed, I actually saw him in Philadelphia. So Brennan was in Abu Dhabi, and Ahmed was in Philadelphia. So Ahmed is 16 year old with history of tetralogy fellow, born in the US and treated in the US. He had surgical replacement uh, when he's now a teenager for his RV to PA conduit seven months ago only. And then because he, the mother was only speaking Arabic, she actually took my phone call, uh, my phone number. I was a fellow at the time. And she called me from another hospital saying that Ahmed now has fever, he's been admitted there for a while. And I asked if they did any blood cultures. She did not know. I asked if they did an echo. She did not know. So it was a peripheral hospital that did not take in account, you know, the history of the patient. So we asked the patient to come transfer to our uh, hospital. And about that time, the patient already have received four days of swift reaction alone. When he came to us, CBC showed uh, high white cell count, hemoglobin of 8.6, high CRP and ESR. Blood cultures are still pending. Chest X-ray showed new left upper lobe and right middle lobe opacification. Urine analysis, eye examination is normal. And echo showed dehiscence of the RV to be a conduit with a pseudo aneurysm and pericardial effusion. Blood was actually getting out of the heart through this to a pseudo aneurysm that was formed by scar tissue and then going back to the heart. He would have ruptured at any moment. So what do you think the diagnosis? Infective endocarditis. It was really a classic case. What do you think the opacification in the lungs are for? So he had, and I, I was involved in one case as the patient was treated for pneumonia, but later on found to have infective endocarditis. Same exact history, RV to PA conduit, very recent. What do you think the opacification is from? Thromboemboli, so showering. The patient has infection of the conduit and it was showering emboli to his lungs, and the ossification was like that. So I had one patient who was treated as pneumonia, got only 10 days of antibiotics sent home, came back with more pneumonia, and the infective endocarditis was evident later. So yes, inf infective endocarditis, definition is microbial infection of the inner endocardium and valve tissue. Incidence keeps varies over time. And right now in the U.S., it's actually increasing again because of the opioid endemic. As you guys probably hear, there is an emergency kind of 
all over the United States because of the opioid endemic and infective endocarditis is on the rise. The risk factors, male sex, age more than 60, 60, injection drug abuse, and poor dental hygiene. Comorbid conditions, congenital and structural heart disease, vulvar heart disease, prostatic heart valves, history of infective endocarditis, presence of intravascular devices or stents, chronic hemodialysis, and HIV infection. In the past, we used to say steroviridins is the most common, but now Staphylococcus is have taken the lead. Coagulase negative staph, enterococci, streptococcus bovis, especially in patients with GI disease and other organisms. Fungi is very common in neonates, as probably most neonatologists here have seen patients with UVCs who have thrombi and fungal infection on the UVC and on the valves. Fever is the most common symptom. These symptoms like chills, night sweats, which Ahmed had, anorexia, fatigue, weight loss, abdominal pain, chest pain, and hematuria. There's usually a new heart murmur, and the vascular immunologic phenomena like Osler nose, genuine lesions usually happen with infective endocarditis on the left side, like the aortic and the mitral valve, splenomegaly. This is the criteria which you guys can have access to, the Duke, modified the Duke criteria. So pathologic cr criteria, actually finding, uh, taking a biopsy or after surgery, finding the infection or the abscess. Clinical criteria is either by uh, echo or by blood cultures. So it's access, we should really say it here because you guys can review it. And then depending on the organisms, how many blood cultures you need, it's a lot of you know, details, you can find it easily. Treatment really depends on the patient, the microbiology and the risk factors. You always get blood cultures and start empiric antibiotics. And patients who are failing medical therapy should undergo surgery. Okay. So we have surgical intervention for those patients if they fail treatment, valve dysfunction, heart failure, extensive penetrating infection, like our patients, fungal endocarditis other than neonatal. So in neonatal, fungal endocarditis, you still treat with medically, rarely take them to surgery. Resist, resistant infection or to prevent systemic emboli. Those are the guidelines for uh, prophylaxis against uh, SBE. As you guys know, it has changed. Most patients now do not get SBE prophylaxis. So prosthetic heart valves, prior history of infective endocarditis, and repaired cyanotic congenital heart disease. Completely repaired congenital heart disease, but with still prosthetic material <coughs> till six months after the procedure. Repaired congenital heart disease with residual defects at the site or with residual defect uh, at the site or adjacent to the site of prosthetic patch. For example, I have a patient now who has the trilogy of fellow with a residual VSD. Should he be a candidate for SBE? Yes, because he still have a residual disease next to a patch. Valve regurgitation due to structurally abnormal valve in a transplant heart. So transplanted hearts usually are indicated. And we give it for dental procedures involving the gingiva, skin infections, respiratory procedure. Uh, when is the procedure's treatment uh, is part of treatment for existing infection, GI or UTI infections. So those are the complications of infective endocarditis. You guys all know them. And thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Dr. Anas, for your uh, very informative lecture. May I invite our uh, speakers for uh, the questions? <coughs> May you introduce yourself, please? Yeah, my name is Dr. Zakia. I'm a pediatrician. I have a question for Dr. Anas. You know, in a general, general pediatric uh, clinic, uh, especially during this season, we usually see a lot of kids coming with uh, high fever, especially if there is, uh, uh, you know, older kids going to school or to nursery. So if I want to follow these guidelines that if uh, less than six months with fever, uh, more than five or seven days, uh, uh, Kawasaki will be high in my list. Don't you think that we will be over treating Kawasaki? So, uh, I mean, by seven days, most of the physician pediatricians will be doing CRP, blood culture, urine, all these things when there is no focus of infection. Like two, three weeks ago, we had uh, uh, at least three or four kids meeting this criteria. So how can we not over-diagnose or under-diagnose such cases? Uh, thank you. It's a very good question. Uh, the, actually, the idea is that you have sometimes to over-treat. So it's not very common to have 
patients less than six months with fever, continuous high-grade fever for more than uh, seven days. Uh, also, it does happen, but you know, especially in the viral seasons, but it's not that common to have it for more than seven days. So in order not to miss any patients, you might be over-treating some, but those patients are really high risk of having coronary aneurysms if you, know, if you miss Kawasaki. So you take the risk, you admit them, and you give them IVIG. If there is no other focus of infection, there is a clear to you. So do you recommend it's better to get cardiologist involved for this uh, before we go ahead? Yes, actually the guidelines recommend the baseline echo for those patients less than six months with more than seven days of fever and no other focus. Okay, thank you. Yes, you're welcome. Yes. Yes. Can you introduce yourself, doctor? Yes. Hello. Uh, Dr. Um, sorry. Yes, uh, probably just the same question for the uh, babies who are less than six months presenting with fever. Uh, it's a common scenario that the mom brought the, the baby and saying that he was febrile for five days, for example. Do we have to consider those or do we have to consider seven days documented fever at the hospital? Thank you. So for patients less than six months, uh, the criteria is to wait till seven days, okay? Especially if they don't have any other criteria. But for patients who have two to three criteria, then you can make the diagnosis sooner, even if they're younger than six months. But if you don't have any other criteria other than the fever, the recommendation is to wait till seven days at least. And then you obtain an echo and consider giving IVIG. So you can wait to give IVIG until after the echo, if you, the suspicion is still not very high, but if you want to be on the safer side, you probably obtain the echo and give IVIG. Good morning. Yes, any Thank other you. question? In a child with uh, GCSPD deficiency, which anti-inflammatory alternative is available other than aspirin? It's a difficult question. I mean, uh, I mean salicylate, you probably can use ibuprofen if you want. It's still, uh, it has significant anti-inflammatory, also the antiplatelets is not very effective, but uh, I have never ever uh, had uh, to deal with that before, but I'll probably look it up before I, you know, recommend anything to do, I would probably look it up, okay? Yeah. Uh, it, it might, you know, you have other options, you can use clobidogrel, which is an antiplatelet other than, you know, aspirin. But to be honest, I'm not sure if I can give Globidogrel in G6PD. So I have to look it up, which is something, you know, it's good. You always you have resources to look it up before you recommend, and especially in zebra cases like this one. So I have never encountered it. I've never researched it before. But before I answer you, I would probably research it. Okay. And uh, in your experience, have you seen uh, Kawasaki disease coming in groups? which We normally see they come in clusters. Yes, and this is, you know, well described, and this is why we think uh, the reason behind Kawasaki disease is a viral illness, because you might uh, not see it for two to three months, and then in one week you see three or four, which is very common. Uh, and we usually see it more often in the spring and the winter when the viruses are more, uh, you know, prevalent. Also, the, the response to IVIG tells you there's probably an infectious cause, which is probably a virus. So I agree, we do see it in clusters as well. Thank you. We have one more question. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Abazin, for uh, your good presentation. I want to ask you because can we hear in a couple of years that this classical criteria for Kawasaki will be revised again and all that lab will be on the criteria or not? It, it could be in a couple of years or not. Just thank you. I don't really know, but uh, you know, it's already have been revised for your uh, safety that, you know, if you have the four out of five criteria, you can go ahead and treat. But even if you don't have the full criteria, then you can use the echo, you can use the labs to help you in the diagnosis. So it's already have been revised in 2006. Uh, so I think this is already have been revised, you know what I mean? You already have the incomplete Kawasaki name to you can use to give IVIG safely without anyone blaming you, even if the patient did not really have Kawasaki, but you just over-treated to be on the safe side. One more question, last question, yes. Yeah. 
Dr. Hazim, I have a question. Uh, the kids having congenital uh, heart defect, like uh, ASD, VSD, or TOC, whatever, uh, if they're going for any dental procedure, we have to give the prophylactic antibiotic also? So, um, you know, it's probably because of limitation of time, I did not uh, focus much on this, but uh, it used to be a lot of the cardiac defects we used to give SBA prophylaxis for, but in 2007, they really limited for patients who are unrepaired to cyanotic only. So patients like Tetralogy of Fallot, yes. ASD, no. VSD, no. PDA, no. Aortic stenosis, no. I, to be honest, many surveys have been done in Saudi Arabia and here in Jordan and, and UAE. People still give it, which I also sometimes, you know, I can compare, you know, be compassionate with because the dental hygiene here is a, probably a bit worse than, you know, Western countries. So after, when they revised the recommendation in 2007, they really stressed the importance of dental hygiene going twice to the dentist for dental cleaning and cleaning your teeth twice u using f uh, flossing and things like that. It's, it's rarely here. It's very common here to see five and six year olds with horrible teeth. So those patients, to be honest, I always look at their teeth and sometimes even for patients, for example, aortic stenosis, I still say to be on the safer side, give them. Also the recommendation says no. ASD I usually never, okay? Also in the past, primum ASD was an indication, but not anymore. But ASD patients are really low risk. I usually look at the diagnosis and then kind of look at the patient before I decide, okay? Some patients who are very reliable in cleaning the teeth, having good hygiene, I usually don't recommend it. So you know, every time you brush your teeth, you actually introduce bacteria into the bloodstream. And the infect most of the patients who had infective endocarditis did not have it after dental procedures. There were no history of dental procedures. So it can happen spontaneously. So really, dental hygiene is the most important factor rather than antibiotics. Yeah, yeah. So I would really look at the patient in a whole. A lot of times I don't, I say no based on the 2007 HA recommendations, but I do take the patient in consideration. What's the situation of their teeth? Is there infection? Um, and whether they're reliable in actually maintaining good hygiene. And also consider the diagnosis. For example, VSD with very high jet, I, us I usually say yes. But aortic stenosis with a very minimal gradient, I usually say no. So you take the diagnosis in part as well. Okay.